Hello and welcome to another episode of ISG Smart Talks, the podcast where we try to educate, inform and entertain our listeners on the impact that technology is having on business. So today I am delighted to have Professor Leslie Wilcox with us. And before I ask Leslie to introduce himself, let me just explain that we are at the ISG Automation Summit. This is the third summit um, that we've done, the third annual summit on the changing world of automation. We have 184 people here with us in Victoria in London. And I'm going to be inter interviewing some of the uh, characters that we have here at the conference who have been involved in this world of automation over the last few years. So first off, Leslie, would you introduce yourself? Leslie Wilcox, Professor of Technology, Work and Globalization at London School of Economics and Political Science. I've been researching information technology for 39 years, the last four looking at automation. Wow, and I heard on stage earlier that you have written a lot of books. I had no idea that you were such an accomplished author. How many books have you... It's because I've got a terrible memory, Barry. Um, I've got to write everything down. So we're up to, we're up to 65 at the moment. They are co-authored books, by the way. Wow, but still, that's incredibly impressive. Everyone says they want to write one book, and you've managed to get involved in 65. That's uh, 65 impressive. different ones, too. Yeah, no, that, that <laughs> is impressive. And I, and I know because I've known you for a, for a little while, that you've written a number of them on this changing world of automation, RPA and cognitive automation and, and AI. But maybe we'll come on to that in, in a second. But if you can just tell our listeners, when did you get involved in this world of, of automation? Yeah. Well, I was 39 years in information technology, partly as a project manager, then as an academic advisor. And late 2014, in, um, uh, the guy who invented the phrase robotic process automation, Pat Geary, came knocking on my door. He said, you really ought to get interested in this. I said, I'd never heard of it. Mm. Uh, he said, well, it's, it's going to be the next thing. And I said, well, I only got two, two questions, really. Is there any there there? And is there a business payoff? Uh, if not, I'm not interested. Yeah. He, he eventually, I won't say f sponsored, because... Uh, supported, shall we say, because they didn't have any money at the time, that yeah. particular uh, supplier. Uh, a research effort, uh, we started small. It rolled into a book, which we published in 2016, of success stories, uh, highly detailed case studies. And we think we sort of mastered how these successful companies did it in terms of 30 action principles that yeah. they seem yeah. to yeah. follow. Yeah, it's, I, I know Pat pretty pretty well too, and he always says, oh, I invented the uh, the term RPA, and I was thinking, I wonder whether he actually did really invent the term RPA, and uh, there we have it. You, he did. You were validating that, that claim. So, no, and, then the, and of course, and I think our listeners may be aware that Pat was chief marketing officer at Blue Prism, who were back in those days were very small, although they'd been around a long time, and have been incredibly successful in this RPA um, space, floating, I think, it's what, two, three years ago? Not to be successful yes, at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, so if you've been involved since 2014, what sort of what are the major changes that you've seen over that last yeah, five years? Well, we, we sort of walked away from that book thinking, oh well, uh, that's that. RPA is pretty easy to do. Yeah. By the time we got to 2017, a lot more people were piling in. Yeah. Uh, or we perhaps oversold the success and ease of it. Yeah. Because we had then had to write a book about 41 material risks that you have to yeah. circumnavigate in order to get to a business payoff. We then thought, well, and now that everyone's known that, you know, this is the powerlessness of books, of course. Yeah. You know, they hadn't read them and they, they didn't um, know anything about what we were talking about. But, and now that we got over that, we'll get a book sponsored by ASG. You wrote the preface. I did. Um, uh, called Robotic and Cognitive Automation, The Next Phase. Bravely thinking that we were in pioneer raccoon skin hat country uh, and wrote one with the cognitive automation cases in uh, that was the next phase to discover by mid 2018 that a lot of people hadn't got there and that they were still wrestling enormously with uh, robotic process automation yeah. so we researched it for a year to find out if that was true and if there was any movement and we found that um, you know only about 20% had really made it to the next yeah. phase and the yeah. rest were really struggling so we wrote our next book yeah which is a backward look almost a backward move 
becoming strategic with robotic process automation due out in October. Excellent, good, and I will look forward to, to reading that one, and which is a good um, segue, I suppose, into the next question, which is, what do you predict over the next five years in this RPA, automation, AI space? What are the big changes we're going to see over the next five? Well, I think it's an exponential growth rate. I, I just it's a, It is a, a clear case of uh, a rising tide lifting most boats. I don't think all of them. Yeah. I think there will be mergers uh, amongst the... The small, the small players that are the vendors. I suspect the the big players in IT are also eyeing up the the bigger RPA vendors. So I can see a, quite a lot of consolidation going on. I will see a lot of uh, value realization from selling some of these companies when yeah. they hit premium price. Um, I think that the movement is very healthy now. That we're over the notion that RPA is just uh, patching up the old world, that it's actually part of the new world, and in fact, a foundation. And if you haven't got a robust, flexible platform that integrates technologies with cognitive automation and hopefully strong AI coming along later, you're, you're not going to get the innovation and the opportunities opening out, which is what you should be doing if you're leading in this space. Yeah. Yeah, RPA really coming of age, I think. Um, great, thank you. So I, I always ask my guests five questions. So give us the first thing that comes into your head when I ask you these five questions. And then what we're going to do, by the way, is at the end of the year, all of the guests, I think we'll have had you know, 13 or 14 guests by December. I will then do a, an episode on, on the answers. So um, the first question is, uh, which technology has had the biggest impact on your career so far? I think it's search engines because I'm an academic and I do research. I have to say, however, though, I think they peaked around about 2005, 2008. Mm. Mm. When you would ask a question, you'd get a straight answer. Yeah. These days, you don't get straight answers. You have to dig very, very hard, and sometimes I think it's worth. Yeah. Uh, it's not as worth the effort. It must have been, I mean, that, if you, you started researching many, many years ago before search engines, the, the process now for you know, researching now compared to what it was before must be chalk and cheese well you don't go to the library anymore yeah. i mean it's just there and and you yeah. it's not just there it's lots there yeah, it's almost too much probably uh, yeah. um uh yes there is too much because mm. a lot of it is uh, is not that relevant and uh it's extremely padded out and people have got in the habit of writing lots of things yeah. Lots of pieces, but with very little content. So digging the content out is like in an exhausted gold mine to some extent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. yes, it's quantity rather than quality. Excellent, good. Um, second question. Is there a technology that you've experienced in your um, career so far that's turned in, out to be a bit of a damp squib that promised most and delivered very little? Well, the one I keep waiting for, because I keep reading about it, is re virtual reality. I just, mm. uh, it, there is this category of, uh, of technology, which is technical solution and looking for a business problem. And I'm sure there are business problems out there, but, yeah. you know, I'm not knocking the technology. What I'm knocking is whether people have had the imagination or the pressure or yeah. need to actually uh, adopt it yet. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Because I can think there's use cases in. You imagine in education, if you're teaching primary school kids about the Romans, and you put on your, you know, your Oculus Rift or whatever, and well, you can they be do in, that in you know, Bath, where I've just been. The Bath, the Roman Baths okay. in Bath, yeah. have have that virtual reality. Yeah. Yeah. People, Romans walking around the bath. It's quite yeah, interesting. Excellent. Yeah, no, but that but one, it doesn't change yeah. your life, though. No, exa exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, imagine being an immersive experience watching sport, for example, always being at Twickenham yeah. as opposed to sitting in your armchair, although you haven't had to leave the house. But no, I agree. From a business perspective, I've not really seen huge use cases yet, but maybe it's a question of yet. Um, third question, is there a gadget that you use which has been very helpful in your life? Yep, noise-cancelling headphones. I love them. Uh, firstly, for aircraft and lots of other places where screaming children might be yep. when I don't want them to be, uh, but also the quality of the sound you can get. You can actually yep. hear the films uh, yep. when they're on uh, transport and all this sort of stuff. Uh, no, I love them. I take them everywhere. Ah, excellent. And funny enough, when I did this, I gave a similar answer because I have this pair of amazing noise-cancelling headphones, neurophones, which, um, which I recommend if you've not tried. Um, I will. What technology or which technology do you think is going to have the biggest impact on business 
over the next decade, or is there one technology or, or many? I think it's the convergence of technologies that's going to make the difference. Mm. I think we're at a stumbling, embryonic, let's suck it and see kind of stage. People, if we put this with that, what happens? If yeah. we put that with that with that, oh, look, that happens, or that doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of uh, fumbling in the dark, as it were, yeah. uh, before we, it might yeah. be five years before the convergence occurs, and then yeah. we, I think we might get a lift off in some some organizations. I think that's right. It's very often businesses, some of the most successful businesses now, and Uber's a great example, they didn't set out with that business model. They set out to be a you know, a, a limousine company that mm. you could just book using using an app. But they didn't realize at the time the benefits of this crowdsourcing model were because they, they'd taken one step in the stepping stone, if you like. They then saw another route to go on. I think that type of thing is going to happen a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yes, very few things are a long-term strategy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Excellent. And then the final question, is there a um, someone who's been had a real impact on your life from a technology perspective, a technology hero, as I like to call them? Yeah, my, my hero is uh, my colleague at uh, Templeton College, Oxford, David Feeney, um, because I keep using his diagram. He has a wonderful diagram. It's called Navigating the Four Domains of Technology. Um, and the, the four domains, very quickly, are, are hype, capability, usefulness, and strategic. And the argument is that a lot, a lot of technology initially is hyped, yeah. so forget about that. A lot of it is capability in terms of technology, it works, but yeah. what, what's the problem? Yeah. The third one is the dangerous area, usefulness. Everyone can have, find it, uh, argue for a use for their technology, but whether it makes it much difference is another question. Yeah. And then, according to him, you know, there's the, the business agenda, which is uh, the strategic use of you know, the relatively few uh, applications that give disproportionate business payoff. And I love it because it, it forces you to focus and I can explain it in two minutes yeah. and everyone understands what I'm on about. I, well, I am going to um, look it up and start to use it. It's in our new book. Well, there you go. I will have a copy of the new book. I'll buy a copy of the new book and, uh, and I will use it because that seems like very good practical advice. So, um, so, Professor Leslie Wilcox, thank you ever so much for joining us on ISG Smart Talks. Um, yeah, speak to you soon. Thank you. Pleasure, Barry. Okay, I am joined here by Craig Jones from Wipro, who is Partner Advisor Relations. So um, welcome, Craig. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. Hi, I'm Craig. As Barry said, I look after a portfolio of uh, our partners, broadly called advisors. ISG is one of our most significant relationships, but um, look after a number of other sourcing advisors across UK and Ireland, France and Spain. Great, thank you. Um, and you've, I know, been involved or working in and around all sorts of operational excellence and efficiency, but where automation has played quite an important role. What have you seen change most over the last, let's say, five years or so? Right, okay, yeah. I mean, in terms of uh, the, the full um, cloud, mobile, smart, everything coming yeah. into, into play, the adoption's been phenomenal. Um, and now since we're here at the Automation Summit, seeing the adoption of RPA particularly. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a technology that I've known for the last 20 years. We used to call it workflow, I think, back in the day, yeah. uh, but now adopted really full, full scale by many, many clients. Um, and now most of them are now saying, what next? Yeah. We'll move on to something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think it from, certainly from my perspective, I've been involved in it for since 2012 so what's that seven seven years now and it's really changed from being this tactical sti sticking plaster solution rpa anyway to being something much much more strategic and certainly there's much more business conversations now it's about how can we use automation to transform our business operations as opposed to you know we've got a small sub process that we want some blue prism or automation anywhere or ui path robots to fix so much more strategic i think it's become what about over the next five years what do you think um, what are the big changes we're going to see in the industry well, certainly moving to cognitive, um, I think that we're going to see on that side, so self-learning systems, um, systems that um, are going to be informative, proactive for us as clients, advising us, yeah. taking this wealth of data that clients, uh, that customers are absorbing through social media, the internet, etc., and begin, begin making services much more personal to us. Yeah. 
uh, cutting the crap out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So on that side, the other side, of course, regarding cloud and the whole as a service model, I think they're going to see clients moving to IT as a service, you know, as much as possible, just being bought as a service in the way that you and I pay for water or yeah, electricity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I agree. I think the as a service may, will play a huge role and already is. And we're seeing massive growth in the industry fueled by as a service. And I think the other thing you mentioned about data, I think. Um, that's going to be the big challenge for enterprises. You have this amazing technology that can you know, automate and lead to huge efficiencies only if you've got the right data in the right structures, which is accessible by the system. And lots of organizations won't. And I think you're going to see a real, well, we already are, you see a real focus on getting your data in the right, in the right shape to be able to be accessed. So good. So tell me about um, Wipro Homes as well, which I've known about for a number of years now. It's been around for, what's, how long has it been around? Three or four years? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah, so what sort of, is it been a huge success? Are you seeing lots of adoption of it? Tell, tell our listeners how it, what it is and how it works. <laughs> so Wipro Homes, um, you know, coined because of the sort of antidote to Watson, if you like, um, but is our huge automation platform, which has embodies in it RPA, but everything through cognitive AI, etc. But also um, a platform to integrate with the other providers out in the, out in, um, out in, the, uh, in the industry. So we have um, a huge ecosystem of relationships with all the major players. Um, we as a, client, as a company have more Watson developers outside IBM than anybody else. Right. Um, so, so homes in and of itself, though, is where we bet our automation future. Yeah. Um, and we've automated lots of um, uh, services inside Wipro. Uh, yeah. We're probably the biggest user of homes, but also um, many of our major clients are now using yeah. homes. So. Yeah. Excellent. No, I think it's a technology which has now really come of age. You were quite early uh, pioneers of this platform-led automation and, and now, as I say, yeah, it really is the right time for it. So I ask all my um, guests on the podcast five questions. So I'm going to ask you five questions. So um, <laughs> the first one, which technology has had the biggest impact on your career to date and why? Now, strangely, I'm going to say document image processing <laughs> because, <Okay. Very> exciting. <laughs> because, because at the end of the 90s, um, when I was um, fairly new into IT, I worked for IBM. IBM developed a huge platform for image processing, which uh, we sold far and wide, um, yeah. which transformed many of the insurance companies and banks around the world in terms of their what was then straight through processing yeah. and, and transformed my career because I sold a lot of that stuff. I became yeah. uh, quite successful, joined some good teams um, and put me in a place that perhaps I wouldn't have been previously. Excellent. Talking about workflow, though, and as I, men I mentioned it earlier, it, it was the sort of precursor to RPA. So as I see RPA coming around, I think, well, yeah, actually, back in the day, we were doing certain things, weren't as sophisticated as RPA, but yeah. actually had, was, a, was a huge influence on my career. Yeah. Excellent. No, great, great answer. It's funny, isn't it, <laughs> you think back of these, you know, because it's not necessarily the best technology, although it was of its time, but it had the biggest impact on your career, which I think is why it's a really good question. Um, what about... The opposite. Is there a technology that you think has promised the most and delivered the least? And I'm say say that with a backdrop of a guy with a VR headset on behind us. <laughs> and and uh, we, we actually spoke about this previously. And I, I would agree with you. Um, once again, uh, used lots of virtual reality stuff 20 odd years ago. Yeah. Um, and it really hasn't made the impact, particularly domestically, into the mm. home. Tremendous gimmicks, mm. tremendous fun, um, yeah. but but we're still trying to find that business critical app yeah, that, that can be useful, yeah, 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 um, yeah. that can really yeah. take businesses into yeah. a different place. Yeah. Excellent, good. Um, change tack slightly. The third question is around: um, Is there a gadget? I'm a gadget freak. I like my gadgets. So, um, is there a gadget that you use in your daily life? Yeah, I'm going to be pretty boring here. Um, I am a mu I love my music, so my Bose the sound dock, oh, nice. which I can just take wherever yeah, I go, yeah, yeah. just does it for me. Yeah. Um, I'm, headphones closes me in too much, yeah. but the sound dock is just fabulous. Yeah, yeah. and great quality <laughs> with that as well. Absolutely. Though. Excellent. Um, okay, back to technology and its impact on business. Over the next decade, is there a technology you think is going to have a significant or material impact on business? 
Well, well I, I'm sorry to come back to it, but I do think automation, um, because I think it's going to transform our ways of working. Um, yeah. It's going to transform our workplace. It's going to transform our home. Um, it's going to transform every aspect of our life. Yeah. Um, automation, cognitive, in all of its guises, yeah. will make um, our kids' uh, home and work life just completely different to ours, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, no, it sounds like you paint a rosy picture. So I'm, <laughs> I hope you're right. Um, and my final question is, is there a, um, an individual who's had a big impact on your career, a technology hero, as I, as I refer to it? I mean, I'd probably have to say uh, Bill Gates because of the way that he almost, not quite single-handedly, but it felt like it when he was mm. first came to market, transformed the way that we think about engaging with technology, um, has transformed so many aspects of our lives through um, the work that he's done. I mean, I could talk about Steve Jobs in the same way, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that has just transformed out. I mean, and we go back to Berners uh, um, as well, about, about yeah. the internet, of yeah, course. Berners, but yeah. but, yeah. but um, I think I'd say Gates. Yeah. I, and, and now, especially with his foundation yeah, and, and, and what he's yeah. giving back as a result of that, I think has been phenomenal. Yeah, no, what a, what a guy. Uh, there was a thing, a video going around recently of the first, I think it was the Windows 95 release. Did you see it when they're all on stage <laughs> yes. and he looks so awkward <laughs> yeah. trying to dance to the music? Poor guy, that was not his favorite place. It's almost a Maybot. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. No, but what, a, what an amazing, what an amazing guy. So, um, Craig, thank you very much. An absolute you, pleasure to talk to you as always. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. So, much. so I am joined here again today at the Automation Summit by Sajesh Gopinath from UST Global. Sajesh, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Uh, my name is Sajesh Gopinath. I'm responsible for automation within UST. So uh, I'm the general manager and go-to-market leader for UST Smart Ops. Excellent and welcome. So how long have you been working in automation related uh, fields? So it's been about four or five years uh, on and off, but I've now taken on a global responsibility within UST for automation. So I'm accountable for automation globally for UST. Excellent. And how big is the automation practice? What sort of stuff do you guys do? So, uh, you know, we are excited uh, that uh, we, we currently work with a lot of customers across the globe. Uh, and uh, as you know, UST has been there for the last 20 years. We've been the strategic partners for many uh, tier one, like Fortune 100, global thousand customers. Yeah. Uh, now automation is a big part of that uh, agenda. So we are seeing a lot of growth in that space. Uh, we work with a significant amount of customers that we have. Mm. And also new customer conversations are coming up, uh, which is very powerful. And uh, the way the... Uh, the space is shifting is really exciting to see. Yeah, absolutely. And you've, I know you've got this smart ops platform, which we heard about this morning. Just tell me, tell me about that. How do you, how do you describe that in 30 seconds? Okay. So uh, if you look at uh, automation as a subject, when you look at end-to-end -end automation, there are fundamentally two different vectors that you need to answer for. One is the action that you take and the decisions that you make. And historically, automation has always been on the action vector. But now, you need to, uh, to drive the true end-to-end -end automation, you need to have the decision and the action vector come together. So what we have done is we have written a cohesive platform which addresses the automation aspect, the knowledge management aspect, and be able to intelligently monitor and uh, drive autonomous operations. So we brought all of those vectors into a single platform. Excellent. I've never heard it described like that. I like it. I might, I might use that myself. Um, what are the major changes that you've seen in the automation industry over the last few years since you've been in, involved in it? What changes have you seen? So initially, it was, if you look at it, there was a lot of uh, uh, proof of concept culture, right? So because the space was new, people wanted to explore. Now it has, uh, the time has come. So the, uh, if you look at last two quarters, I would have spoken to more than 100 customers, all the way from the C-suite uh, to yeah. even the practitioner. Yeah. Now it is about delivering value. So yeah. it is important that uh, people look at it beyond the hype cycle of the technology, but is automation truly delivering value? Yeah. So that's where I see the shift is happening and you will see that language coming more and more. Uh, people are asking for those kind of uh, outcomes that the automation can deliver to them. Yeah, it's gone from being tactical to much, much more strategic and much more outcome based as well. And I, I would, I would re recognize that and would agree with you. What about the next five years? What do you think is going to, to happen over the next half decade? 
Yeah. So what, the way you have to uh, look at uh, the the space is that uh, one is the customer expectations are changing quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. So th you will see the convergence of the customer expectation, the system transformation that needs to happen, yeah. and having an intelligent layer that support both of these aspects. That's where the world I see is going. Yeah, it expands out of just RPA into much, much more of a enterprise-wide, more strategic layer. And I think the challenge will be orchestrating the sort of the all of the different bits of technology across the enterprise or automation technology, stitching them together so that they can work across the enterprise. So that's why we uh, we look at illuminating that workflow for the enterprise. So that's why we we created uh, the, the one of the aspects of the platform that we developed. Yeah. is to have that orchestration as a key differentiator. Yeah, no, I, I saw that in the presentation this morning, which I thought um, was your colleague did a very good job. Very bright guy. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So the um, so five questions that I always ask my guests, so I'm going to put on you without any preparation. So um, which technology has had the biggest impact on your career to date and why? Yeah, so I would say automation, not because I am currently responsible for automation, but what it has given uh, me personally is uh, an insight about what really matters in the enterprise. So if you look at the conversation that we are having at the C, C level, uh, we really are able to understand the business impact these kind of technologies are uh, delivering. And it also enhanced our own thinking about what we should do beyond just the automation. So yesterday, Professor Wilcox was uh, talking about is uh, uh, where things are heading to is about looking at uh, not only just automation technologies, but the overall ecosystem. How is it delivering the business value very quickly? Yeah. Yeah. So having that uh, know-how or uh, you know, getting that expertise or experience from the customers was really, really useful yeah. for me to look at uh, this, uh, the entire technology space in a different lens. Uh, uh, excellent answer. Um, is there a technology that you think promised the most you were all excited about and then delivered very little, sort of turned into a, a damp squib? Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it that way, but uh, see, blockchain is a technology that I, you know, I've heard a lot about it. Uh, I, you know, we ourselves have worked on it significantly, uh, but uh, the, pra you know, the amount of practical applications is still, uh, still yet yeah. to be seen, the true power of it. Yeah. Because they, everybody believes that that's the next uh, kind of an operating system, so to speak. Yeah. But uh, we are yet to see how it can make it more practical. Yes, lots of talk and little action so far. And who knows, maybe it may be the technology that will come of age, but right now it's still, there aren't, there aren't enough. Iceberg. Uh, yeah, exactly. With, uh, we are seeing only yeah. one small portion of it. Yeah, and I think it might be, right? But And certainly certain aspects of distributed ledger technology might might well be. But I, I agree with you. It promised so much for the last few years and really has delivered, um, I, I suppose it's debatable, but delivered little value to enterprises yet. No, good answer. Um, is uh, My third question is, is there a, a gadget that you use on a regular basis that um, that's your favorite gadget? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm giving the obvious answer, which is my <laughs> phone, uh, but uh, after the PDA started becoming yeah. more and more prevalent, that was really helpful in terms of managing your time, managing your uh, yeah. this thing. Uh, we have to be careful that, it, you know, sometimes it takes uh, too much of a personal space as yeah. well because yeah. it's quite accessible. But, uh, but given uh, that it has really improved the productivity quite a bit, uh, and, uh, you know, the aspect of you going away from emails and going more towards interactions, etc. It's really, really powerful yeah. uh, tool. So I really yeah. would say my iPhone is the, yeah. uh, my I, key gadget. I would have to agree with you, I think. I think if I lost uh, this iPhone, I'm not sure how I would manage, right? It's, it's everything, that's isn't it? In the, in the palm I mean, of that, your that's hand. True. That's yeah, true. from recording a podcast to yeah. your emails, to your social media, to your photographs, to your music, to everything. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think only, what, the iPhone's only about 10 years old, I think, now, isn't it? Something like that? Um, amazing how quickly we've become so reliant on these, on these devices. Um, my penultimate question, which technology do you think is going to have the biggest impact on business over the next decade? Yeah, so definitely uh, I believe the uh, AI, machine learning, those technologies uh, will really uh, deliver value uh, because, uh, you know, the struggle that enterprises had was uh, be able to tap into their uh, digital exhaust and be able to get the best out of the data that they have. Yeah. But there are still uh, uh, th there are still some roadblocks that we have to come, uh, I mean, come, you know, we have to solve those roadblocks basically. Yeah. But uh, I think that uh, that has real value. 
but the key would be that enterprises should look at uh, not the hype of the technology, but the business value that they're expecting from the technology. Yeah. And if they look at from that lens, uh, I'm pretty sure AI ML technologies can really shape, uh, uh, you know, yeah. can deliver a significant value to the business. Yeah, no, I to totally agree. I, th I think when I did this, I gave the same answer. I think I'm really excited about particularly what machine learning can do over the next decade. So, And then fi my final question is, is there a uh, an individual, a person that's had a big impact on your career to date, a technology hero, as I, as I call it? Yeah. So uh, there are many, uh, but uh, if you look at, uh, uh, again, I, I, I comes from a more of a business background and that, that's where operational background. Uh, so definitely uh, my own uh, ex-CEO, Sajan Palai, and the current CEO, Krishna Sudendra, they look at problems from a business lens and yeah. they look at what is that is delivering to the enterprise. So that they were really a, a good role model coming uh, coming through the ranks but also if you look at externally uh, uh, people like satya nadella from microsoft you know the way he has Ch change that enterprise completely yeah. from Microsoft, uh, Indra Noe, and so so quite a few of them uh, yeah. from a CEO ranks and how they see it. Uh, and we talked about Jack. Yeah. I mean, amazing individual and how yeah. how he thinks about business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so those are uh, some of the <laughs> heroes. Yeah, no, in inspiring leaders, all of them. No, no, great, great answers. So, um, Sajesh, th thank you ever so much for uh, for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Very, thank you so much for the time. So I am now joined by Sirkum Ibrahim from. IPsoft. Circum, um, welcome to ISG Smart Talks. Do you want to tell our listeners uh, who you are and what you do? Hi, thank you. Yeah, Barry, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today at the ISG Automation Summit. I am one of our cognitive consultants at IPsoft. Uh, I've been here for a little under a year now. Tell me about your role and also tell our listeners about IPsoft. Sure. So IPsoft is a 20-year-old organization headquartered in, in New York. Our Chairman and founder um, and CEO Chetan Dubé started the company with the intention of liberating organizations from repetitive uh, operations and really enabling them to um, leverage what was then the, the sort of path of automation technologies. Subsequently, we've grown in two distinct areas. One is IT operations automation, where we are Credit is one of the leaders in that space. And more recently, over the last five years, we've created an intelligent virtual agent or a virtual assistant called Amelia that many of your listeners may be familiar with. And Amelia is widely regarded as one of the most mature products in that market. So using machine learning and natural language understanding for cognitive engagements through chat, through speech, etc. Excellent. Thank you. And I, I know... Um I mean, I certainly believe that we will be talking to machines in the same way that you and I are talking now, and Amelia is at the forefront of that. How, she, I think you were telling me over dinner last night how many conversations she has over a period of time, right? How many, how many dialogues is she in each day? Give well, it, it's certainly in the millions. Um, we have single clients, and, and Amelia is deployed currently in over 120 different environments, um, and they range from tens of thousands of discussions a day up to a quarter of a million um, discussions a day. And, and what's unique about Amelia is, unlike some technology like IVR, where it's just sort of catch and dispatch, um, Amelia is actually running processes end-to-end -end and actually um, without any human touch whatsoever. So that putting those numbers into context without any human engagement at all um, is it, quite astounding. Excellent. So tell me, how long um, have you been working in automation related fields and what changes have you seen over the last few years? So I've been, broadly speaking, I've been involved in automation for about four to five years, but had slightly different roles. Historically was supporting providers in sort of services in, in demonstrating their services to end users through um, social media, through content, through events, and uncovered a really small niche technology um, after someone spoke, um, someone called Wayne Buffield spoke at one of our conferences about someone five, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of our conferences about five years ago, he was at Tele O2 at the time, um, and it was this technology called robotic process automation. I think it's because it had the name robotics in the name, it was just really interesting, and what Watching the onset of that market and organizations grow from tens of people to hundreds of people to thousands of people um, in such a rapid amount of time has been really exciting. And that was my first foray into automation and, and subsequently into intelligent automation more broadly and all the other technologies that, that 
a company that's so machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, looking at blockchain, and, and as well as many others, which are now making this a really exciting market to be involved in. Great to hear who, how Wayne Butterfield inspired you in your, your career. And Wayne is, of course, our head of our cognitive um, technology services at ISG in Europe. So that's, I suppose, looking back. What about looking forward over the next five years? What changes do you expect or predict to, to happen in this industry? I think that we're going to see a real convergence of capabilities and vendors. I think that people are going to have to learn to be involved in sort of multidisciplinary teams far more often. And organizations are trying to do most of, if not all of it themselves. And I think that we're going to have to, um, as providers, going to have to learn to play more nicely. And I think that the way that buyers are buying technologies in the automation space is changing the market significantly. And providers need to, to change in line with that. Excellent. Thank you very much. So now I have five questions for you. And we talked about these over a glass of wine at dinner last night. So you should be well prepared. So the first question I have for you is which technology has had the biggest impact on your, your career or your life to date? I think without a shadow of a doubt, it's got to be social media. And I think that when we were talking about this yesterday, I was quite specific. I think I used Twitter because um, I can't think of any other technology. I mean, it's been really integral to me in terms of my personal career, in terms of getting information out. And I think that it's really um, narrowed the gap between people interested in technology and people who are providing technological services. You can get that information on demand now. But I think that Twitter it specifically was the one that's had the, the biggest impact. I think that if you look at the socioeconomic impacts that it's having um, on everyday life and the democratization of news and information, which is a double-edged sword, right? Um, but I think that that's been really powerful. It's amazing, isn't it, how you, I mean, even if we're watching TV, you have Twitter, you're mobile with Twitter up in one hand and you're watching TV on the other and you're commenting in real time on things that are, that are happening, right? It's, it has been an am amazing success story, Twitter. I do think it's changed the way we communicate. So, no, good answer. Um, second question, is there a technology which you think has had lots of promise and you were really excited about and then it failed really to be as live up to that promise turned into a damp squib? Anything spring to mind? The characterization of it as a damp squib maybe puts a, a, an overly negative inflection on this. But in, in my opinion, the one technology which I think I had such high hopes for, which could still make it, but um, uh, having to be absolutely honest, and, and as an organization in the interest of disclosure, but we, we have this technology in our tech stack as well. So there'll be some people who aren't too happy that I'm saying this, but I think RPA. I think RPA had great amount of promise. I think that the way that RPA providers positioned it as a catch-all for a panacea of all problems and um, a, a great technology for every utilization and deployment hasn't lived up to its expectations. In saying that, I think that it has, it is the best gateway into digital transformation that I've seen. So again, a bit of a duplicitous answer because it is great at doing that and getting organizations, democratizing the ability of people to use technology. Um, and as a gateway, it's been fantastic at that. But I was one of the, the voices that said that it's going to change everything once upon a time. And, um, and a bit reticent about that, but still great promise nonetheless. Yeah, it's a maybe overinflated expectations. It will get there in, in the end, but there's this uh, trough of disillusionment before you get to the plateau of productivity, right? So, oh no, ec excellent. Um, is there a gadget that you use on a daily basis that you just couldn't live without? So I, I hardly use my phone to make calls, but it is my iPhone. It is my gateway to the world. It is how I communicate with my nearest and dearest most of the time. It's how I store my memories. It's how I access new information. Or music or news or... Everything. I, I, I use it on, on the way into work, during work. It is my primary... Um, I, I'd say that it's probably my primary device of choice, more so than a computer or a laptop or anything. I, I, I could do most of what I do now on my phone, which if you had said this to me three or four years ago even, I, I wouldn't have believed it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, the iPhone's only like a decade old, right? I mean, it's just changed everything. How do we live without uh, un it? I, 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 un <laughs> unbelievable, yeah. Um, so penultimate question, which technology do you think is going to have the biggest impact on business over the next decade? So my, uh, my, my heart says AI because that's what we do in conversational AI is obviously a big part of, of my everyday life. But um, just having a look at the onset of virtual uh, digital organizations, I think that 
blockchain and, and specifically cryptocurrencies um, of the ilk of, of, of Bitcoin um, or Ethereum. Other, other digital currencies are obviously available. Um, but I think that when the likes of Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft start issuing their own currencies with the power that they have in decisioning and, and data acquisition, um, together with the hold that they have over markets. And in the future, I mean, if you look at drone technology as well, um, delivery of goods, I think that they will then have a full spectrum hold on the market and it will be extremely powerful when that technology is engaged with the platforms and the communities that they, they own. And it will change retail and it will change life in, in general. So I would have to say cryptocurrencies and, and as a facet of, of sort of blockchain. Yeah. I mean, they would change governments, it would change, decentralize everything, right? I mean, it's so powerful. I mean, yeah. I, I actually think that it will make technology companies, I mean, a lot of technology companies are already powerful, more powerful, some of the large technology companies than most governments in the world. But I actually think that that will be the inflection point where large enterprises will become as powerful, if not more powerful than, than countries, because they will be able to issue their own currency. And it will be very, very difficult to, to track so from a socioeconomic background I, I, and politicians aren't talking about it which is why i think that it, it has a massive propensity for good potentially but it's something that we should keep an eye on so it's again another yeah. one of those double-edged swords no, I, I totally agree It'd be interesting to see which way it goes um, but I, I think it's a really good answer um so final question is there somebody who in your professional life has had a big impact on your career today i call it a technology a technology hero anyone spring to mind yeah, so I've got a couple um, of people who, this, this is very personal to me, who have been um, extremely helpful in, one, in helping me to understand the technology landscape and what the landscape of the future will look like and debunking some of the, the ideas I had when I was a young, aspirational sort of technological enthusiast. And the other is somebody who, in terms of how technology is iterated, how it's explained and, and how technology is impacting people it has sort of mentored me through through a lot of that so the first would be francis cardon who is now at pegasystems who was previously at openspan the ceo there um and when i was just a young whippersnapper um francis took pity on me and and um saw that i was very very enthusiastic about technology in general and as someone who was a ceo of their own company and and bought by one of the largest organizations of its type in, in Pega um, to take the time out to just talk to me on a very human level and explain technology to me in a, a no-nonsense, plain English way was really, really um, valuable. So he's definitely one of them. And it's quite an opinionated chap as well. So if, if yeah. you don't know Francis, I would definitely recommend you, you have a chat with him. Right. Uh, the other is Shell Chiara, who is currently at UiPath. And um, it looks after their sort of customer advocacy and customer experience piece. Um, and Shale has been one of the people who has sort of guided me and mentored me for, for many years in terms of the impact of this technology. Um, he probably won't be happy with my answer around RPA as a technology that I'm disappointed by, but um, he has uh, had a, an immense impact on me personally and uh, in terms of his career as well. I mean, um, he's grown a number of companies very, very successfully from a marketing and positioning standpoint. So a good person to know. Excellent. They sound, both sound like inspirational characters. So, um, Serkan, thank you ever so much for joining us on ISG Smart Talks. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.